So let's pray. So Father, I come before you now, and I pray that as we look at a profound truth that sometimes it's hard to live by, that your spirit would lead and guide us this morning, that your spirit would have the freedom to continue to move like he's already been moving, sensitizing our hearts to your voice and to your leading. In your name I pray, amen. So this is our last of our four-part series called His Story. Now, if you're just coming today and it's your first time, I, I borrowed this term from Pastor Ron, who talked about how Jesus' story became his story and how Jesus' story became our church's story. And so I wanted to preach a series on how his story became my story and how his story will continue to be our story moving forward. And that surrounds a few phrases. Look up here. Everybody's what? All the six people said that. Everybody's what? No. All right. Nobody's? Perfect. And anything is? Possible. possible. Yes. So N.T. Wright said one time, he said, it's not good enough to have a biblical worldview. And what that means is looking at the world through the lens of the Bible. He said, that's not good enough. We actually live in and should have the worldview that anything's possible because a man who was dead three days under his own power got up and walked out of a tomb. Anything is possible, amen? And so we live 2,000 years later in a world where anything is possible and we see it all the time around us. We see things that we never thought would happen are actually happening. Things we never thought we would accomplish, it's actually being accomplished. But the same thing applies spiritually, applies with Jesus. Because I want you to follow the logic here. Jesus is an impossibly possible God. Jesus is an impossibly possible God. He does amazing things. I want you to look at this passage of Scripture with me. Um, so in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 22, this passage is probably Paul's highest Christology. This is where he takes the most about Jesus and cram-packs it into these verses. And I would like to encourage you, if you really want a better understanding of Jesus, go to this chapter and read these few verses and just meditate on it about what Paul is actually saying about Jesus. But I want to point out a few things here for us today. So it says this, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. I want you to see that again. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and he is supreme over all creations. For through him, God created everything in heaven, uh, the heavenly realms, and on earth. He made things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is the body. He is the beginning of the supreme, uh, beginning supreme of all who rise from the dead. So he is the first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything on earth, in, in heaven and on earth, by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes us, us who were once far away from God. You were his enemy, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ, physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence. Isn't that cool? He has brought you into his own presence and you are homely. Oh, you're not homely. You're holy, blameless as you stand before him 
without a single thought. So I want to point out a few things here. First of all, Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. So if you want to know what God is like, and there's a lot of people in our community and our culture, they want to know what God's like. Well, thankfully, we're not left to our own devices because we have the person of Jesus. Jesus is the exact representation of who God is and what his nature is, what his character is, how he treats people, et cetera, et cetera. He's the very visible expression of the invisible God. He created all that we see and don't see. He is the one who can take nothing and make something. Now, one of the things that we've, as human beings, we've, we, we still can't do and we will never be able to do, that is taking nothing, like absolutely nothing, and making something out of the nothing. He is the only one that can do that. And you say, well, Shane, what about the Big Bang? If that's what you want to believe, I'm fine with that, but Jesus banged it. <laughs> All right? He was the guy that banged it, right? <laughs> so he takes something, he makes something out of nothing. And this is critically important. Why? Because he's still doing it. Do you realize that right now the universe is expanding faster than it ever has? It's, it's growing. I still can't get my mind wrapped around the fact that infinite is getting bigger. <laughs> that hurts my brain. And then you start talking about dimensions and realms and all of these things, because it talks about spiritual realms in scripture. Like, I don't know about you, but I've never really peered into a spiritual realm. I don't get to walk around and go, ooh, angels. <laughs> oh, the bad demon. I don't want to see you guys. But, but he made all of that. He's the God of the macro and the micro. He does the impossible. Not only does he create all this, but he holds it all together. God is not distant. He's not far away just letting creation do what it wants to do. He's actually holding it together. Aren't you glad he's holding it together? <laughs> I am so thrilled that he is holding it together. Jesus is fully God. And here's the part that my mind just has a hard time wrapping around. He took us and he reconciled us. Scripture says we were dead in our sins and he made us alive in Christ. And what does it say here? He reconciled us and now we're what? Holy and blameless without fault in his sight. When was the last time you saw yourself like that? Whoo. I don't know about you, but this is a big weakness of mine. I never walk around going, I'm holy, blameless in his sight, right? Because we do have an adversary who's called the accuser who is constantly what? Accusing us. And sometimes his voice is a little more predominant in our life than Jesus' voice. But yet we know here that Jesus is saying, hey, when I look at you, and I know this is scary for some of you, but when he looks at me, he's like, man, you're beautiful. <laughs> you're holy and you're blameless in my sight. Like that is just profound. I want to look at this other passage of scripture in Luke chapter one. This is, this is such an amazing passage of scripture that we really don't really focus on a lot through, but this passage of scripture is where the angel comes and tells Mary, hey, Mary, I'm going to turn your world upside down. And you're going to be the mother of God. <laughs> I don't know about you, but parenting's already enough pressure. <laughs> Let alone knowing you're going to be mom to God. Right? I don't get how all that works. I really don't. It's a mystery. But I just know that she immaculately conceived and she birthed Jesus. The God of everything, the infinite that keeps getting bigger, came in human form, not as a ruling king, but as a crying baby. That's amazing, is it not? But then what does it say here? There's this verse in Luke chapter 1, verse 37. It says, nothing you see is impossible with God. Now, this phrase goes in connection to Mary's aunt or cousin, Elizabeth. She was barren. She wasn't able to have children. 
And when God is talking to Mary, he says, hey, you know, Elizabeth couldn't have children. Well, I'm in the making the impossible possible. And she's six months pregnant. And then Mary's response is, nothing you see is impossible with God. But we have so many stories in Scripture where Jesus walked into impossible situations and made it possible. There was a dude that could not move, that was stuck on a mat by a well, and Jesus walked by, and after Jesus left, that dude's up running around. Why? Because Jesus takes the impossible and makes it possible. That's who God is. He defies all of our expectations. He walks into the realm of impossibility and laughs and goes, now watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to feed 5,000 men plus women and children with some loaves of sourdough and some fretly called halibut. That's my version. And he just begins to break it up and he starts feeding people to the point where there's basket loads left over. That's who God is. It's the impossible God making things possible. And you say, Shane, why are you spending so much time on this? It's because I want this central core truth to continue to be our truth as we move forward. Church, there is nothing out there that we cannot do to advance Jesus' kingdom because anything is possible. Anything is possible. I've actually been praying with God. There's there's this cool story about Ephesus that a lot of us don't know, but when Paul and John and Mary and probably Mary Magdalene in different times and different places in Ephesus started churches, they had no idea that 90 years later, that Ephesus was going to be over 90% Christian. They had no idea. Now, if you know the story of Ephesus, you know that's a pretty big deal. It's huge. Why can't God do that here? Why can't Petaluma be a shining example of what happens when God gets loose in the community and all of a sudden people are walking around reconciled to Jesus? full of hope and full of joy, full of the Spirit. Isn't that exciting? It can happen. It is possible. We just have to believe it and act on it. It is possible. Let's move on to another point I want to make. The impossibly possibly, the impossibly possible you the impossibly possible you. God can do anything that he wants in you and through you. All things are possible. Now, I know that you're sitting there going, I don't know, Shane. (laughs) You don't know my situation. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what my life's like. And you're right, I don't. But I do know my own story. Listen, church, I'm not up here because I had it all together. I'm not up here because I was the top of my class. I'm up here by the sheer grace of God. My brothers and my sisters, I I was the kid that you passed over in school. I really was. I was the kid that nobody thought anything would happen with. I can remember my ninth grade world history teacher. We come into class and we're sitting down and she makes us go around and sign our names and she looks down the entire list and goes, Shane Woodleaf, who's Shane Woodleaf? I'm like, first day of school now, ninth grade. Raise my hand. She looked at her desk and goes, see this desk? Right here in front of my desk? This is yours for the rest of the year. I was like, okay, war is on. (laughs) But but that's who I was. My high school principal at my graduation, all of us were graduating. I didn't have a big graduating class. I went to a Christian school. There was like maybe nine of us in my class. Said all these great things about my classmates. When I got up there, the only thing you said was, 
is the only thing I can say about Shane is nobody's going to push him into a corner. That's it. When I went to university, I went on academic and spiritual probation. They put me, I kid you not, they put me in the room with the guy who was charged with handing out demerits. That's how bad it was. But then God stepped into my life and he just turned it upside down. And he took the person that was the most unlikely and allowed me to preach in different countries and all over the Southeast. And he's brought me to this amazing place. Not because of everything that I can do, it's because of what he can do. Anything is possible. My dad, I told you a little bit about my dad. I'll tell you more later, but man, his whole family were a bunch of roughnecks. They weren't good people. And my grandfather, I'm not going to tell the whole story, but when my grandfather passed away, they had unplugged him from all the machines and and the family was mourning. They had the sheet over top of him, the whole nine yards. And 30 minutes later, the nurse goes in to get her clipboard. My grandfather sits up in the bed the sheet falls off of him and he starts talking to her. Well, she runs screaming out of the room and my grandfather starts preaching to his family about what he saw in the realities of heaven. My entire family gets saved. My dad, who went to 27 different high schools, 27 different high schools, who barely graduated, that was only good at math, My dad led individually, in person, over a thousand people to Jesus in his lifetime. Yes, my mom. My mom was so shy when she met my dad, she would not let him sit across from her because she couldn't make eye contact with him. They had to sit together. She was so shy, she couldn't even look up. And now my mom for decades had been teaching women Bible studies and teaching Bible studies to youth, et cetera, et cetera. God can do anything. My sister and her husband weren't able to have a child. They were broken, but God was moving. And God took them out of Nashville, Tennessee, took them to China, and they adopted this beautiful little girl named Macy. God moved continents to make the impossible possible. And she's such an amazing girl and she's so intelligent, I don't even like to talk to her. (laughs) But the weird thing is, is like when you look at her, she's Chinese, but she has a deeper Southern draw than me. So it really (laughs) messes with you. But I love her and I'm just like, wow, look at what God has done. My brother was an addict was an addict. He had all kinds of problems in life. And now my brother leads worship and is the uh, celebrate recovery pastor for a church of 3,000 people just right outside of Nashville. Why? Because God can do anything. Nothing is impossible with God. Now, am I saying all this to brag? No, it's the opposite. Scripture says God takes the weak things and the broken things to confound the strong and the wise. So I'm just weak and broken. (laughs) We all are, amen? Amen. But yet God desires to make a way for us. He desires for us to take those situations where maybe our marriage isn't great and our relationship with our children isn't great or our health issues or whatever. He wants to enter into that situation and make a way to do the impossible so that we can look back with a huge smile and say, you know what? I thought back there I was doomed. (laughs) But God walked in to impossibility and it became possible. So I can stand up here with full conviction and say, my brothers and my sisters, wherever you are right now in your relationship with Jesus, whatever is going on in your life, God is bigger than that. 
And you don't have to draw his attention to it. It's not like that scene in the Old Testament where the prophets are cutting themselves and yelling and screaming, trying to get Baal to do something. God is immensely present to us right now. He knows the hurts, the fears, the pains. He knows the things that we're branding impossible. And he's like, just let me and watch how that becomes possible. Amen. He can do this for you too. I want you to look here. Ephesians chapter one, the power that raised Jesus from the dead resides in us. It resides in us. Now, I want you to, again, think about this. A dude was dead for three days. Three days. And out of his own power, got up and walked out of a grave. Science hasn't duplicated that. I hadn't read that on any news report yet. That is an impossible thing. But God's like, watch me. Watch me do the impossible. That same power is within us. And then Ephesians 3, and you've heard Pastor Ron teach through these things, but in Ephesians 3, it says, God is going to do more than we can think. He's going to accomplish more than we can dream. How? By the power that's out here? No, by the power that's in where? In us. See, when we pray, where does your mind go? A lot of times it goes where? Out there. Very rarely do we connect it with the spirit that's where? In us. God is already saying, put me to the test. Pray for the big things and I will make it happen. I remember there was this guy named Steve and I had the opportunity to leave Steve to the Lord. This was years ago. And I knew a friend of his and I contacted the friend that was also a Christian and said, hey, you're not gonna believe this. I just led Steve to the Lord. And he starts crying. He said, Shane, I prayed for 27 years that he would come to Jesus. And Jesus answered his prayer. So my encouragement is keep praying. We don't know what God is doing. We just said it. He's, he's in the background doing stuff we don't have a clue that he's doing. God wants to do the impossible through us. But look at this, Romans chapter 8, verse 31. This is a verse you should take a picture of. This is something that you should highlight in our Bibles that says what? Since God is for us, what? Nothing can stand against us. My brothers and my sisters, this is a profound truth. Firstly, most of us in here struggle with the idea of God being for us. Why? Because we listen to the accuser too much. But we're adopted into his family. He knows us by name. He loves us completely and totally with every bit of who he is. And he's saying, I'm for you. Therefore, nothing can stand against you. And church, he's already said that the gates of what? Hell can't stop the church. So my brothers and sisters, what would happen if we dare to dream? What happened if we said, God, here's my spouse. Do the impossible. The child that we're so worried about. That we just say, Jesus, I'm, I'm taking them out of my hands and I'm putting them into your hands because you're the God that makes all things possible. Some of you in here are struggling with deep hurts and pains, not because you chose them, but because somebody chose them for you. Guess what? Out of my own life story, I know that God can heal those things. And he can set us free. And if we let him, he'll actually use it to expand his kingdom. Isn't that awesome? But I want to show you the key. The key here is what Mary says back to the angel. Mary says this. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. 
I want you right now just to look at that phrase and in your own mind, I want you to pray that for you. Go ahead right now where you are. I want you to pray that for you. Everything that he said about you, just pray that it will come true. Release it into his hands. So as we look here, these last two things, I want you to see here two steps to help you move forward. Choose faith. Choose it. Faith is the substance of things, what? Hoped for, but not what? Seen. So let's not limit God. Let's just give it to him and take our hands off of it. Let us choose faith. Some of us in this room are doubting whether God can still use you or wants to use you. I'm going to ask that you would take your hands off yourself and give, it, give yourself to Jesus and let him do what he wants to do. Because I can tell you this, it's going to absolutely blow your dreams away. How he's going to use you. Church, listen to me. How, how, how old is this church now, Pastor Ron? 26 years old. Do you know that a church that's 26 years old that had 18 different places where it met, you're sitting in an impossibility that God made possible. You're living in a miracle right now. Listen to me, churches, churches, don't, churches don't survive that many places of moving. But yet, this church did. Why? So they can be average? So that we can say our church is just a possible church. No, it's so that we can live the impossible church dream and see God do amazing things. See, you're already sitting in a miracle and you didn't even know it. Church, he wants to do amazing things. So what? We're going to choose faith and then I'm going to encourage you, put his kingdom first. He said, what? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And what? All these things will be added to you. Jesus even said the things that we've given up in this life, we're going to see even more of it. So I just want to encourage you today. Let's believe that anything is possible with God. The God who is still expanding the infinite is sitting with you in your home at night, listening to the struggles and the tears and the heartaches and the heartbreaks. He's right there and he's saying, just let me. Oh, I want to do something. And it's going to blow your mind when I do it. But just let me do it. And church, I want to say to you, he has planted us here so that we can, in a good way, blow Sonoma County up with Jesus. Do you know what? Petaluma can be a place where when people drive through it, they're like, whoa, I don't know what just happened here, but I just encountered something. I encountered the Spirit of God here. I imagine what it would be like if this impossibly possible God breaks free in Petaluma and we get to be a part of it. Wouldn't that be amazing? So let us, for all we're worth, grab a hold of the truths that we're loved. Everybody's loved. And that nobody's perfect. And out of that, we're the prime candidates <laughs> to see that anything is possible with God. So we're going to sing Waymaker again. We should be singing it a little differently now like we mean it, like we know it can happen because God will make a way. Let us pray. So Father, I come before you and I'm thankful for what you are doing. Jesus, I don't, I don't know it all. I don't, I don't know what's beyond the next moments. 
but you do. You have a vision for this church that would literally break our brains. Jesus, may whatever you said about us come true. And Father, for the individuals here today with heavy hearts, coming from hard places and sad places and hurtful places, God, I pray that starting today, that my brothers and sisters will be walking examples of the impossible God who did amazing things in their life. It's in your name I pray. Amen. 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 All right.